Well, hey there, kiddos. We're going to continue solving quadratics today, and today we're going to do it using a method called square roots. Um, before we start this, though, I want to say, and I want to give you this disclaimer, in that solving by square roots is not always the best method. It's going to seem to you like it's really, really easy, and it's going to be the one you're going to want to use all the time, but there are definitely times when the square root method is the best method, and there are times when the square root method is not the method you want to use. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go through and when we wrap up all the solving when it's best, but for today, Everything is solving by square roots, so you want to get down the method, and then at the end of the solving part, we will talk about when it's best to use which method. So solving by square roots is just what it sounds like. We're going to be taking the square root of stuff. And so here's what I need you to remember, okay? If I take the number 25 and I take the square root of that, the answer to that is 5. And the reason it's 5 is because if I do 5 times 5, it equals 25, okay? It is also negative 5. And the reason for that is if you do negative 5 times negative 5, that also equals positive 25. So every time you take a square root of a number, it is going to have two solutions, one positive, one negative. And so that's a big deal that you need to get first. Another thing that you need to understand is that if I take the square root of x squared, the two numbers that multiply to make that are x and x. And so the square root of x squared is just x we will not put a plus or minus on the x squared because it'll just be x and we will stop at that. We won't worry about neg the negative x part at all, okay? But for the number part, there will always be a positive one and a negative one. So for number one, it's really simple. x squared equals 225. If I want to know what the two roots are, I want to know where this function is going to cross the x-axis, where its solutions are, I just got to take the square root of both sides. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the square root of this side, and I'm going to take the square root of this side. Well, the square root of x squared is just x. The square root of 225, if you use your calculator and type that in, you get that it's 15. But like I told you, it's going to be plus or minus 15 and we will just put this the two signs both in front of the number so that when I am reading it or when someone else is reading your paper they understand that it is both the positive 15 and the negative 15 this way you don't have to write it twice it's just a shorter way to write it so when we come across a question like number two I have 4x squared minus 25 equals 0 and I want to know what the roots are where does that function cross the x-axis in order for me to solve using square roots, first of all, I need to have some perfect squares happening. Well, 4 and x squared are both perfect squares, so is 25. But I can't just take the square root as is. I'm going to have to move this 25 over to the other side so that when I take the square root, I have something to take the square root of. So I'm going to add 25 to both sides, which will give me 4x squared equals 25. Well, everything I have is still a perfect square, so I'm going to go ahead and take the square root of both sides Everything's all positive and nice. So the square root of 4x squared is going to be 2x. And the square root of 25 is plus or minus 5. Well, I'm not done because x is not by itself yet. So what I'm going to have to do is divide both sides by 2. And when I do that, I get that x is equal to plus or minus 5 halves, or 5 divided by 2. Okay. And so that's what my solution is. It'll be either 5 halves or negative 5 halves, and those are my solutions. So number 3. If you look, the only perfect square I have in my problem right now is just an x squared. So that tells me square roots might not be the best method, but wait just a minute. Let's get this plus 5 moved to the other side so all I have over here is a perfect square, just the x squared. So if I subtract 5 from both sides, I end up with x squared equals zero. Well, zero is definitely a perfect square because I can multiply zero times zero and it makes zero. Okay, so if I take the square root of both sides, I get that x equals zero. This will be the only time you do not put the plus minus sign in front because zero doesn't have a sign. It doesn't have a negative. It's just zero. That means that this function right here when I graph it has one solution and only one solution because it just touches the x-axis at zero and that's it. Now look at number 4, because it looks way different than 1, 2, and 3. I've got 4 times the quantity of x plus 2, all of that squared, equals 324. Well, I agree that 4 is a perfect square, and I agree that this is all a perfect square because the whole thing is squared, but I don't want this to be together. So the first thing I'm going to do is divide both sides by 4 so I can cancel out those 4s. And what I end up with is x plus 2 squ squared is equal to 
81 because that's what I get when I divide. Well, I now I have perfect squares. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides, and when I do that, I get that x plus 2, because that's the square root of that. It's just you take off the squared, and what's left is what you have. And the square root of 81 is plus or minus 9. Well, now here the plus or minus is going to come in handy because I need x by itself. So we're going to have to do something with this. In order to get x by itself, I'm going to have to subtract 2 from both sides, but I'm going to have to do it twice, once for the plus 9 and once for the minus 9. So here is how we're going to do this. Change colors here so you can see it. So I have x plus 2 the first time is equal to positive 9. And if I subtract 2 from both sides here, I get that x equals 7. So one of my solutions is at x equals 7. The other one, I am now going to do x plus 2 equals the negative 9. So I have the plus or the minus. I'm just going to separate them. And when I subtract 2 from both sides this time, I get x equals negative 11. So now I have two solutions, one at 7 and one at negative 11. They all have had two solutions, plus or minus 15, plus or minus 5 halves, so I've had a positive 15 and a negative 15. This one just has to have, happens to have two separate numbers. So let's look at number 5 here. So I've got a picture. A zookeeper is trying to enclose a pin at the zoo. The pin is an isosceles right triangle, and isosceles means, all it means is that both legs are the same length. Okay, that's nice to know. If they weren't the same length, this would be a totally different problem. There is already a fence on the side that borders the path. So there's a fence over here. What they want to do is enclose these parts with the dotted lines. The area of the pen will be 4,500 square feet. We can buy feet, fencing and whole feet only. We want to know how many feet of fencing should he buy. Well, first of all, area of a triangle, because that's what I'm dealing with, area. That's what he tells me. Okay, so area of a triangle, if you remember, is base times height divided by 2. Well, in this problem, because it's an isosceles triangle, the base and the height are the same. So my area which is 4,500, is going to be equal to x times x, which is x squared, divided by 2. Well, I need that x squared by itself so that I can do the square root method, and the only way to do that is get rid of that denominator by multiplying both sides by 2. So you end up with 9,000 equals x squared, and to find out what x equals, I'm going to take the square root of both sides. And so when I do that, I get that x, and I'm doing whole feet only, so I'm going to round this to the nearest whole number. It comes out to 94.86, blah, blah, blah. Well, 94.8 rounds up to 95, so I have plus or minus 95. Now, only one of these answers does me any good. If I am talking about the perimeter of a fence or the perimeter of something, it's an actual thing. And I'm, so I'm talking about the length and the width, or the base and the height of that triangle. And the base of the height of that triangle cannot be negative. So this negative 95 here does not count. The only number that counts is the positive, because the negative doesn't make any sense. That tells me that this will be 95 feet, and this will be 95 feet. And so if I want to know how many feet of fencing he should buy, I've got to add those up. And if I add 95 plus 95, I get that he needs 190 feet of fencing. And so that's your answer, okay? So now let's talk about these other word problems, okay? I've got two more back here on the back. The first one's about Beyonce. She's going to display her collection of wood carvings on top of her bookcase. So just up here on this top part, I don't really care about the rest of the bookshelf. Okay, she's going to put them up there on top. The collection covers an area of 400 square inches. We want to know what B has to equal for the top of the bookcase to have the correct area. Since I'm just looking at this rectangle, I just need these dimensions. It's 5B here and it's B here. This dimension is extra information. I don't care how tall the bookshelf is. I just want to make sure that the top of the bookcase will fit everything. So again, we're talking area. So that's length times width. So that's B times 5B, which is 5B squared, and it equals 400. I'm going to do the same thing. It's telling me to round, which tells me I'm probably not going to have perfect squares, but it's okay. I'm going to go ahead and divide both sides by 5, and so I'm going to get b squared equals 80, and I'm going to take the square root of both sides so that I can get what b equals, and I get that b equals, and I'm going to do to the nearest tenth here. So the square root of 80 is 8.94, which rounds to 8.9. And remember, this is the plus and the minus. But again, we're talking about area of something, a length and a width. Negative numbers don't make sense here. So that tells me that B has to be 8.4 inches. The positive is the only one that matters, so it's the only one that we will take. The negative makes no sense in this problem. 
So last one. The height of a skydiver jumping out of an airplane is given by, whoops, I'm sorry about that, that function, negative 16t squared, I cannot get it on the screen for some reason, plus 3200. We want to know how long it will take for the skydiver to reach the ground. Well, if h is the height, then at the ground is height zero. So at zero, I have negative 16t squared plus 3200. Well, I want to get things by itself. I want that t squared is what I'm looking for. So the first thing I'm going to do is subtract 3,200 from both sides. So I'm going to have negative 3,200 equals negative 16 t squared. Well, now I want t squared by itself. So I'm going to go ahead and divide both sides by negative 16. And I get that 200 is equal to t squared. Well, so I'm going to take the square root of both sides. And when I do that, I get that the square root of 200 is 14.142. Well, it says round to the nearest tenth, so plus or minus 14.1 equals my time. But again, we're talking about time. How long did it take the skydiver to get to the ground? Well, it took the skydiver plus or minus 14.1 seconds, but we don't operate in negative time. It just it doesn't happen. Okay, time is positive. He might be falling down towards the ground, but his seconds are continuing to increase. So that's going to be a positive number. So the time it takes him to reach the ground is 14.1 seconds. Again, the negative here doesn't make sense. So when you're doing a problem situation, word problem kind of thing, you want to make sure and you ask yourself, do both the positive and negative make sense? And if not, only pick the one that makes sense. So we will practice this when you come to class tomorrow. I will see you then.